All right, Hi, everyone. Uh, so once again, nice to meet you, everyone. Uh, my name is Siva. I'm a research scientist. And I work in sensor simulation primarily uh, for Wabi. And today we'll be doing a quick talk on simulation. So as uh, Raquel mentioned earlier in the previous section, we've talked about in the past sections of this tutorial, all the components required to build a highly performant self-driving system. But the key question that was left over from the data section was, uh, how do we test this autonomy system safely before deploying it into the real world to make sure it can handle all the situations we might encounter? So, for example, you in the long in the long tail, there might be some rare actors, or there might be some vehicle coming out of occlusion we want to handle appropriately. How do we test that the self-driving system can be safely deployed and handle these situations ahead of time? So, the industry has multiple ways for doing testing of the self-driving vehicle. I'll go over a couple of them before talking about simulation. So one approach uh, that is done in the industry commonly is testing on a structured test track. So you can actually take a self-driving vehicle with the autonomy system on the hardware it's on, the vehicle platform, put it on a test track that you build. The companies will build these in different sites remotely outside of public roads. And you can create scenarios that you want to test. So the benefits of this type of structured testing approach is it's high fidelity. You get the true performance of what's going to happen in the real world on these particular scenarios that you build. Uh, the challenge is that because this is a test track, there are real people involved potentially, unless you decide to use dummies, which have a little bit of lack of realism. But if you have uh, actual like people and uh, occupant, like pedestrians and stuff involved, you cannot have as safety critical scenarios that you would want. And you can't do testing at very high speed maneuvers, for example. And yeah, like I mentioned before with high fidelity, you also have reactivity. Um, but it's also quite expensive, both manually time consuming and uh, costly to build these type of scenarios on a test track. But definitely a good signal for performance. We talked about structured testing on a test track. The other option that an industry also typically uses is uh, log replay. So you can have a fleet of self-driving vehicles collect data on all types of scenarios you might encounter in the real world. And then you can apply open loop evaluation. Each time step, you can run the autonomous system, see the perception prediction outputs, see what the motion plan might be, and see how it might behave in the real scenarios that you might see in the real world. So this is high fidelity. We have the real world data that you can run autonomy on. Uh, it's somewhat safety critical in that you can find and mine safety critical scenarios that if you drive enough sufficiently in the real world, you can collect. But it's still time consuming and scalable to get that type of data available. And the critical thing that Raquel mentioned earlier in the previous talk with data is that this open loop evaluation, you can't really get the true system performance that you might see where the SDV is interacting with the other actors in the scene. It moves to a new location, you get new sensor data, and you have this kind of like closed loop evaluation that we want to have. And that kind of results in the last type of approach that we're going to talk about for testing self-driving vehicle safety, which is simulation. Oh, and the yeah. there will be there's supposed to be an animation where you can see the vehicle kind of turn into our lane. Uh, it's kind of the whole point of being closed loop is the simulation. Uh, but essentially, you can see that uh, in simulation, you have this closed loop testing of the full autonomy system. Uh, there's definitely a domain gap because you're building a virtual world. So it's not potentially as realistic as the real world. Uh, but you can create any scenario you'd like at high speed vehicles, all types of occlusion or whatnot. And it has a reactive environment. And if you build your simulation in the right way, you can also potentially have it to be scalable so that you can run at scale for both testing as well as all types of other applications of simulation, such as finding potential issues in the time system that you're not aware of through adversarial attacks. Um, so here you can see like a weird mesh that might cause issues with the detection performance. Uh, also for data generation, uh, creating uh, at scale efficiently ground truths as well as uh, uh, annotations that you can use for training the models, as well as for using it to learn from experiences such as in closed loop training. Okay, so we kind of motivated the use case for why simulation might be useful for autonomy testing and its kind of pros and cons. Uh, but how do you actually run an autonomy system in, in a closed loop simulation? So this is a real quick recap. You take sensor data, autonomy system runs, and it generates some control outputs of steering and actuation, acceleration, and so on. Um, one approach that the industry will do, and as well as in academia as well, to do closed loop simulation is you make the assumption that the time system is modular, and then you have perception, prediction, and planning. The planning system you can generate easily from, say, ground truth of the bounding boxes and trajectories. What are the inputs to the planner? 
And then you can run closed simulation, just testing the planner module and just do behavior simulation of where the actors are going to be at each time step. So this is very fast. You can run this type of simulation at maybe many thousand frames per second. Um, but the issue is that you can't test fully end-to-end -end autonomy systems in a black box manner, and you cannot measure the full system performance. So you can imagine you might have errors in your perception or prediction system. Those errors can propagate, say, a misdetection or a false positive that can cause significant consequences to your downstream autonomy performance. So it's important to be able to test the full autonomy system, and that's where the closed loop simulation comes into play. So it's closer to the real world setting, and uh, you can have the full autonomy in the loop, but there's the burden of having a higher computational requirement because you need to simulate the sensor data now. Okay, what are the things we need for a closed loop simulation system? You can kind of think of a closed loop simulation system as a high fidelity complex video game for self-driving systems. And so we kind of broke it down into three parts, virtual creation, virtual dynamics, and vehicle platform modeling. First step you need to do, similar to video games that you might play like Grand Theft Auto, is you need to build the assets for the world. This includes the vegetation, the buildings, the other actors in the scene, such as vehicles and pedestrians. You need to have a library because the self-driving vehicle operates in the 3D world, so you need to build a virtual 3D world for it to interact in. The other thing you need is you need to define like the level that your self-driving vehicle is playing in, for example. So this is called like a scenario representation. Where are the other actors in the scene going to be? Where are they going to go potentially into the future? What's the desired outcome you want it to occur? So do you have like goals for each of the SDV and the actors? What type of interaction do you want it to be? And also you can describe in the scenario representation details about what type of assets you want to have in the scene. Once you've built the virtual world level for that, the test you want to run for your self-driving vehicle, you need to unroll the dynamics of what's going to happen over the course of time. So this includes the agent dynamics of what the other actors are going to do at each time step based on what the actors are doing as well as the STV. And this includes the STV dynamics as well. So you can imagine self-driving vehicle apply steering and acceleration. You need to predict based on say the road surface, the friction, uh, where it might go the next time step so that you have this interactive close-up simulation. And then after we have the dynamics and the world creation to evolve the scenario over time, we need to actually have the autonomous system in the loop and interacting with the simulation system. So this involves simulating the sensors of the solid driving vehicle based on the platform configuration you specify. This might include LIDAR, camera, radar, et cetera. And this also includes, involves the compute that is running on the state car or truck that you're running the solid driving vehicle with. So because uh, hardware in the loop is what one component we'll be talking about for simulation, where you actually want to measure the actual timings and latencies and how the system is operating on an actual embedded system on the device. Cool. So we'll now first talk about the first component of simulation, which is virtual world creation. And specifically, we'll talk about building assets for the 3D world. So there are several desirable properties you would like to have for assets in a 3D world, um, similar to kind of qualities you would want, say, in a video game engine as well. Uh, you want to have these assets to be very suitable for rendering and physical dynamics of the system. You want to have high fidelity geometry because the main application of having assets is for modeling the dynamics of the world, having physics, as well as for rendering the sensor data you want to provide to the autonomous system to be of high quality and realism. The other component is that these assets, you want to be able to control what they're doing. You want to be able to modify their appearance and representation. So that's the other desirable property of these assets is controllability. And you want to have them at scale and have them to be diverse because like we talked about earlier, we want to have the long tail situation of coverage covered for the time system. This includes unusual actors such as the duck we saw earlier. So the, the diversity is the key component for making the simulation truly be able to test any scenario you want for the time system. And of course, we want it to be fast, uh, be able to render this data at real time so that we can run the time system in close up at scale. So there are two main paradigms for building assets of the 3D world. One is uh, through kind of a artist created approach, which is typical in like many like game engine based environments where you have a, a set of expert artists that are building these 3D geometry assets. You specify their geometry, their texture, their material properties, how you rig the assets for animation, all the customizable components you want for high quality asset. So the benefit of this type of approach is you have full and precise control of what you would like to have in your virtual world. But the downside is that it can be quite expensive and time consuming 
you can't really get the full diversity of the real world assets potentially uh, just from asset creation through manual design. And the other approach, which is also one that we're heavily pursuing at Wabi is to kind of build digital twins from real world data. The idea is that you can have self-driving vehicles or any type of data collection vehicle uh, collect sensor data of different real world traffic scenes. And you can build representations of assets uh, of the different vehicles, pedestrians, background, et cetera. And you can use these to then compose them into a new scenario. And through this approach, it's automatic and at scale. So it's more much faster to kind of generate a large asset library. And kind of one, if you have the good, you'll see in the, in the works we cover in the next few slides, uh, you can get some pretty high fidelity and realistic asset shapes uh, and appearance. But one aspect is also kind of still a work in progress in the field is getting the controllability aspect that you get from kind of game engine based assets. Being able to have like a fully decomposed representation of geometry material to allow for all the type of controllability you would want and also for like animation purposes. For example, being able to open doors of a car or to change the traffic light signals. All right, so we'll now talk a bit about asset representations. We've broken it up into three categories. There's the background static scene. Uh, there's the rigid actor assets such as vehicles um, and other like uh, unknown objects such as like cones and construction, and then deformable actor assets such as pedestrians. Uh, and throughout the section that we talk about for asset representations, uh, many of the reconstruction approaches we'll cover uh, have a lot of similarities between them. And it's just a matter of how you combine them to kind of get the final output approach. So let's talk first talk about the background assets. Uh, one simple approach for background asset reconstruction is simply if you have lighter point clouds and depth information about the scene, you can just apply aggregation and aggregate your point clouds into a shared coordinate space and create kind of a 3D circle representation. And this is what you kind of see in the visual here. So this type of aggregation approach is very simple, scalable to create, and um, it can be a pretty efficient for rendering. Uh, but the issue is that you kind of only collect the data you have and then you simply combine it. You have holes and noise in your sense from your sensor data built into the assets you create. So there's been a lot of recent work in real rendering. Um, it's a whole field. I'll just touch on it briefly here. You can basically take the sensor data you have, um, have a neural representation of the scene, perform rendering, and you try to make sure that the rendered data that you get matches the real world data you had originally. And this type of reconstruction supervision allows you to learn a pretty good asset representation that has been shown to have much higher fidelity in terms of geometry and appearance. Um, the one issue is that most of the neural scene reconstruction approaches kind of focus on this like interpolation setting where you can only render views of the scene from what you've already collected in the past. And it's hard for you to deviate your trajectory of the STV, for example, in a closed loop simulation to completely new views because we don't do completion of the scene. It's mostly reconstruction. So the sparse areas where you don't see much of the object, maybe for faraway regions or for areas you didn't cover in the original trajectory field of view, you might have issues with the reconstruction, which causes maybe problems in your simulation later on. And there's been a recent work actually at this year's CVPR that kind of works on combining not just reconstruction from the original data you have, but also learning across the whole library of data. This is like the neural kernel surface reconstruction that enables you to like learn not just from the data you get, but also from past data you have to have this like learnable representation for more high fidelity reconstruction. All right, so we covered background assets. It's a combination of like data, machine learning, optimization, and potentially also some semantic priors about the world that you can encode. And we'll see it's also the case for rigid active assets too, like uh, vehicles. So once again, there's the approach of aggregation, which is very straightforward. You can see some example of aggregation assets here for LiDAR intensity and texture. But once again, you have the same issues with the background, which is noisy aggregation, incomplete holes, so that if you view the asset from another viewpoint, it might not be complete and you'll have a much larger domain gap than you would have expected. And once again, there have been a lot of work in neural radiance fields where you can kind of uh, have a neural representation where you perform rendering to reconstruct the actor. You can see one example here um, where you can kind of generate 
a physically based neural rendering model of material properties as well as texture that kind of decomposes the asset. Uh, and then you can get realistic rendering results. Um, but still the problem with these optimization approach based approaches is that it can be kind of expensive to train over time to generate these representations and it's still per scene. Um, another type of approach is explicit optimization approaches. And this is where you can encode some bit of semantic prior of what humans uh, build because most of the objects that you encounter in a self-driving environment are man-made objects. Those typically have computer-assisted design model, CAD models available. And so you can learn a asset representation on a library of CAD models, then optimize that to represent some of the objects you observe in the real world data. So the benefit of this is that you get semantic priors about the different shapes you have, uh, and you have a good initialization that you can optimize the asset from. So you can, exam for example, on the right, you can encode like the wheels of the asset or the doors that allows for animation abilities that will be much harder to learn just from real world data alone. And then yeah, there's another approach here. This is also, we've covered previously like uh, optimization based approaches. And this is a kind of a different type of approach called feed forward prediction. So maybe most people are familiar with this. Instead of optimizing directly from sensor data, you take the sensor data as input, you just directly predict the asset representation of interest. And there are several approaches that try to combine both feed forward based approaches with optimization. So maybe you do feed forward to do the good initialization of your asset representation and you fine tune or optimize based on the real world data uh, to ensure that it matches as best as possible. This allows for like more scalable and fast reconstruction than just optimization alone. And you can learn maybe a good latent representation of your shape. And yeah, these are some works that actually kind of combine all three of these type of things I've been talking about, which is uh, having large amounts of data, uh, applying like uh, rendering for optimization, but also feed forward prediction together. Uh, and this is all with respect to like neural gradients field based rendering approaches. And here, these are all conditional based. So you take a particular image or point cloud as input. Given that initial input of the object, you try to reconstruct the asset. And there are also generative models where you can simply sample um, assets from like a lane rep distribution. And this can allow for like generating completely new assets that have not even been seen before. Uh, so this gives you some more flexibility of the types of assets you can create for safety critical situations, but you might have a little bit limited quality and realism. And there's still ongoing work for building assets that you can generate that have like the fully decomposed representation we're talking about for uh, realistic and controllable rendering. And then finally, uh, we talked a bit about reconstructing assets from the real world, but there's also the ability to generate adversarial assets for simulation. You want to potentially find issues with your autonomy system that you hadn't encountered in the past and finding ones that try to attack the autonomy system to make the detection be poor or the planning performance be poor uh, can be also of interest because uh, these are all machine learning based systems. So you have to be able to handle potentially out of distribution data appropriately. And finally, we'll talk about deformable actor assets. This is also another whole huge field in uh, the computer vision community. I think there's a whole workshop yesterday on high fidelity neural actors. So this is only gonna to touch on it like for a couple minutes before we move on to the next section. So uh, for animatable objects, it provides new challenges that you have to account for than just rigid and static actors. Uh, you have deformation involved. So being able to incorporate the animation of how a pedestrian moves or even animals move that you might encounter in the real world is a key part of being able to build assets from data. And you can hear, see here that uh, one approach is to induce a prior by incorporating, say, a simple or pair, like a human parametric model that you can then fit based on observations of the real world. Both feed forward and optimization based approaches do this. Um, the benefits is that you get the full human shape. So you have a very strong prior. You never miss any parts of the actor. But uh, there's still some work. I think it's an ongoing active item in the community to like not just have uh, a human body, but also shape of the clothing and maybe some of the accoutrements they might have on them. Yeah, and then here's a model free type of approaches and hybrid approaches, which don't necessarily only fit on a parametric human model, but also are able to handle uh, objects that don't have a constrained skeleton associated with it. So you can see here, like uh, volumetric or implicit representations are being used to 
directly reconstruct from sensory data the shape of the actor or the appearance. There's even some work that's been done on animal reconstruction recently and learning the proper skeleton for deforming that animal over time. Cool. So we talked about the asset library for building a virtual 3D world. Now we're going to talk about building the scenario representation. And to get, we'll give it like a quick example of what this actually kind of looks like. Uh, yeah, cool. So here's an example of a, a definition of what we mean by a scenario representation. You can specify a road layout. And given this road layout, you can start to specify actors in the scene. So for example, where the ego vehicle is, where it's going, what it might goal it might have or intentions it will try to do. You can specify where the other actors are in the scene and their properties, maybe their, what type of actor you want, if it's gonna be a sedan versus a truck or an ambulance, um, what speed it might be going at. So given this kind of asset representation, uh, this scenario representation, you might wanna then specify what type of interaction you wanna have between the actor and the self-driving vehicle. So here we might wanna have a cut-in. Given the scenario representation and our asset library, we can compose them together to create a complete kind of scenario that you unroll over time. So yeah, this is all about the virtual creation. The next session will be on the dynamics. I'll talk a little bit about now, like uh, what are the different ways you can define a scenario representation? So there are three main ways uh, people do in the community building scenarios. Uh, there's first manual creation, extracting from real world logs, and then automatic generation. So for manual creation, you can have two ways of doing this. Either you can specify a kind of a programmatic language, or you can have a graphical user interface to define a scenario. And similar to what we kind of showed in the illustrative example in the past few slides, you can simply kind of manually program with a human expert who's very familiar with what scenarios you want to test, the actor locations, what's the potential, like say, time to collision is an example of a parameter you might want to specify between the actor and the SDV. And then given this project control of the scenario, you can kind of run it on your time system and see how it performs. So the benefits is you have precise control over the scenario and you can evaluate exactly what you would like to evaluate uh, on a scenario set. Uh, but the downside is that you have to manually build the scenario and it's oftentimes challenging you have to tune the parameters quite well to get the interaction of interest that you desire. The other option is to extract the scenario from real world data. So essentially you can uh, collect real world data, annotate it either through offline labeling or human annotations. You can build a scenario representation from the actor's locations and scene placement that you observe in the real world. So the benefit is that you get real world scene configurations uh, and true trajectories that they were executed by the actors. And so you have the benefit of the scale and diversity, but it's limited by what you collect. So you cannot generate as many safety critical scenarios as you might want. Uh, and so this is kind of like one of the limitations with real world based scenarios. But as we'll see, there's the manual creation, there's the real world data, and there's the automatic generation. There might be ways to combine them to allow for compensating for some of these limitations on their own. And then there's the automatically generation scenarios from real world data or um, maybe potentially heuristic approaches. I'll talk about those uh, in the next couple of slides. There are several desiderata that you would like in automatic scenario generation. That is also kind of a repeat of some of the desirables you want for assets. You want it to be realistic, diverse, and controllable, and also fast. So for real based generation, this is one approach for automatic generation of scene layouts. Given a road topology, you can specify with uh, handcrafted rules, with parameters that you can learn potentially from data, the gap between different vehicles that you sample along the lane lines, um, what type of actors you sample can also be learned kind of from a distribution, and you can create potentially some of these layouts that you see here. So one thing is that through this type of heuristic-based approach, you can always guarantee physical possibility of the scene you sample. Um, and it's very simple to have data-driven models that kind of learn the parameters that you create to specify the scenario representation. But the limitation is that if you have handcrafted heuristics that, that kind of sample the actor placement, you might be limited by the type of map layouts you can generate scenarios for, and you may not be able to capture all the real-world diversity of scenes you might see. Uh, 
And uh, kind of a variation of this is scene graphs that you see maybe in also video game engines like procedural content generation. You can specify like a graph of the actor layout and row topology, and you can then create scenes by sampling along this uh, grammar. And you can see here like a hierarchical scene representation of specifying the road layout and then the actors uh, through this like kind of graph. And here you can also like learn potentially from real world data here to kind of match the distribution of scenes you sample in simulation to be similar to what you use in the real world for autonomy performance. And there's been a lot of recent work on using deep generative models to build scene placements. So you can see here several different approaches using GANs, autoaggressive models, normalizing flows, and diffusion models. Uh, all are focusing on kind of like taking some initial scene raster or representation of the road topology and then trying to predict where all the address might be in the scene. So the benefit of this, you can learn from real world data to build your scene representation. Uh, there's no handcrafted rules or heuristics, uh, and you. but the downside is that you have limited controllability uh, in being able to specify exactly what type of scenarios you want. Uh, but there's ongoing work, I think, to make this like a bit more controllable. And all the approaches we talked about for like automatic generation focus mostly on scene layout, and I think there's still like a lot of work to be done on generating scenario representations that not focus only on layout, but also the intentions of what the actors are going to do in the scene and what type of outcome or interaction you want to have with the SDV, because that's kind of the key crux of what you want to have for autonomy testing. And so here again is a recap for scenario representations. Manual creation, you have very precise control, but it doesn't scale as well. You can extract from real logs as well, but you may not be able to create all the safety critical scenarios you want. And with automatic generation, we focus mostly on scene layouts, but you can still build and create lots of scene representations at scale through this, this method. All right, I will pass it on now to Kelvin to talk about, given this virtual world, how you can evolve it over time. So, so far we've heard about um, how do we build a 3D digital twin from real data, right? And then how do we sort of compose scenarios using those digital twins so that we have scenarios to train and test our self-driving car in, right? Um, so let's now turn our attention to how to, can we sort of bring these scenarios to life um, by simulating the, dy the dynamics of those um, of the virtual environment. So in particular, we'll focus on two aspects of virtual world dynamics today. Um, one is agent dynamics. That is, how do the behaviors of different traffic actors in the scenario um, behave or evolve over time? And then also SDV dynamics, right? So how does the SDV states evolve over time given its control inputs? Um, so let's start by first discussing um, actor dynamics, right? Um, so to begin, what exactly is actor simulation? At a very high level, uh, what we want to do is given a map of the virtual environment around us and the initial conditions of the sim simulation world, right? Like where all the actors are in their initial states, uh, we want to be able to simulate how those actors uh, behave over time and how they, uh, for example, how they, where they might go over time, um, how they might react to changes in the environment or react to each other, and how their internal dynamic states might change over time as well. Hmm. Okay, so we want to do this for every traffic actor in this scenario, right? And broadly speaking, we can categorize this again as uh, rigid actors like our vehicles or motorcycles in the world, or as the formable actors like the pedestrians in the world. Um, for today's talk, we're going to mostly focus our attention on rigid actors and in particular cars, right? Um, but we do know that there's a bunch of literature on how do we actually simulate the behaviors of the formable actors, um, which we unfortunately won't have time to get into today. Um, yeah, so you might be thinking to yourself then, um, how does like this task of actor simulation actually relate to other tasks in self-driving, right? So for example, in motion planning, um, we heard today that we, we also just care about like, how do we learn to drive in the real world, right? Um, can we simply use a self-driving car's motion planner to sort of uh, simulate the behaviors of different other traffic actors in this scenario? Um, and the answer is not quite, right? So in motion planning, what we care about is um, capturing like the optimal behavior, optimal driving behavior uh, possible. So what I mean by that is uh, you want behaviors that are very safe, um, possibly very efficient, um, 
Do you want behaviors that are law abiding, for example? And we know that with human driving behavior, um, human driving behavior tends not to be quite that optimal, right? Um, we know some human drivers can be frustratingly cautious or recklessly aggressive. Um, they can be quite suboptimal in their decision making. And from our day to day human, uh, day to day driving experiences, um, we've likely encountered quite a few incidents of humans sort of just ignoring traffic rules altogether. So we want to be able to capture all of those behaviors, whether they're optimal or not, um, in the actor simulation and use those in order to actually expose the self-driving vehicle to sort of a variety of different scenarios that it might actually see when we deploy it to the real world, right? Okay, so what about motion forecasting? So we heard earlier today in motion forecasting, what we want to do is sort of model and predict um, how humans would actually drive in the real world as well, right? Um, I think there are three key distinctions between motion forecasting and actor simulation. So first, um, in motion forecasting, uh, because it's a part of the autonomy stack, uh, what it operates on is actually these partial or no noisy observations that you might get from um, sensor data. Whereas in actor simulation, you actually get the full perfect state information coming from your simulator, right? Um, second of all, uh, we actually don't know the goals and intentions of the other traffic agents in the environment in motion forecasting. This is something that we explicitly need to infer for, right? But in actor simulation, oftentimes um, these goals and intentions are what's given to us or what's specified in the scenario. And it's our job to sort of like simulate realistic behaviors that sort of um, fulfill those conditions, right? And then perhaps most importantly, uh, motion forecasting is an open loop task. And what I mean by that is that um, the predictions of a motion forecasting model doesn't directly influence sort of what kind of inputs it would get in the future. Right. But in actor simulation, we're actually in a closed loop setting. And what this means is that the prediction of the actor simulation model actually directly influences what kind of inputs it would get in the future. Right. So any small mispredictions you make in an actor simulation model model will actually compound over time. And that could potentially lead you to simulate increasingly unrealistic behaviors. So as we'll see, um, what this means is that in actor simulation, you can't really rely on this like IID assumption. And a simple sort of supervised learning setup um, is often insufficient to learn good actor simulation models. OK, so what do we want from actor simulation? Um, I think very simply, there's sort of three things, um, if we can overgeneralize a little bit. Uh, first of all, we want realism, right? We want to be able to simulate realistic actor behaviors so that um, we can trust that the results we get in simulation actually translates to the real world, right? And then we want diverse actor behaviors so that we can serve sort of, um, ex expose the self-driving vehicle to the full diversity and vividness of the real world um, traffic scenarios that we might encounter. And then finally, we want our actor behaviors to be controllable so that we can actually sort of realize um, the semantics of the scenarios that we've specified. And this is particularly important if you're taking a structured approach to sort of like validating or testing your self-driving vehicle. And if you want to, for example, upsample those rare long tail scenarios that are particularly important for uh, testing or training your self-driving car on. Okay, so we're gonna talk about um, recent work on how to sort of achieve each of these requirements um, in a little bit more detail next. And we'll start off with uh, realism. So perhaps the simplest approach to get started is to just use rules-based behaviors. So here we can leverage classical car following algorithms like IDM or classical uh, lane change models like mobile in order to simulate like very simple um, actor behaviors. So this is a very simple approach to the problem, right? And it's also very easy to implement. Oftentimes you can actually get pretty uh, reasonable results as well because you can directly encode um, sort of our prior knowledge about what constitutes realistic uh, human driving directly into these rules, right? We can get these models to avoid collision at all times or avoid driving off-road, right? But then this naive approach can only really take us so far, right? The problem with a rules-based approach is that um, the rules that we design and we use are often far too rigid in order to sort of fully express what 
kind of human driving behaviors we might encounter in the real world, right? And this might be okay. All we care about is simulating simple lane falling behaviors, but we want to capture the long tail of actors uh, sim or human behaviors, right? And this includes things like complex non-compliant behaviors, like uh, performing cut-ins in front of the self-driving vehicle or very illegal U-turns, right? We want to be able to simulate various styles from very cautious drivers to very aggressive drivers. And then we want to also be able to model um, the very nuanced interactions between different drivers in the environment, particularly around like areas like on ramps or intersections. So it's simply unscalable to try to expect someone to handcraft all these rules in order to capture all of this stuff, right? Um, and we think a much better solution is, um, can we just learn how to do this directly from data instead? All right, so um, behavior cloning is one approach to doing this. And the high level idea behind behavior cloning is quite simple. Um, what we're gonna do is we'll just go out, collect an offline data set of state action pairs, um, simply from observing how humans drive in the real world. And then we're going to use supervised learning to train a policy that takes um, state as input, right? And regresses sort of what the expert action was. So this approach is appealing because it's super simple. It uses this supervised learning setup that we're all familiar with, right? Um, and then we can also really easily go out and collect a large data set for this approach because um, we can simply just observe how humans drive in the real world. And what this means is that we can scale this approach um, and its performance simply by collecting more data. However, policies trained in this way are well known to suffer from what's known as covariate shift. Um, so what that means is that the policies aren't robust to other distribution sta states that it might encounter um, that are induced by its own actions, right? So if we were to unroll these policies in closed loop simulation, um, their errors might compound over time. And this could lead to increasingly unrealistic uh, actor simulation behaviors. So this is actually a fundamental problem to behavior cloning. And next, we'll take a look at some techniques um, we can like try to mitigate this concern. All right, so a very simple approach is based on the intuition of what if we can simply regularize the policy away from these um, out of distribution states, right? So for example, what we can do is we can handcraft a bunch of um, auxiliary losses that sort of penalize a model for um, the appeal as a model for uh, causing traffic infractions or entering into other distribution states like collisions or off-road driving. Or uh, another approach is we can sort of um, regularize a model to stay close to um, sort of the states that it's observed during the training process, right? One way you can do this is you can learn a probabilistic forward model of um, how the states evolve over time. And then you can use this forward model to regularize the policy during training so that um, it penalizes actions of the policy that causes it to enter states where the forward model is uncertain. So this approach is super simple and minimally changes the behavior cloning setup. Um, and it also allows us to incorporate a lot of common knowledge, common sense knowledge about um, realistic human driving directly into the training objective. However, it can be challenging to handcraft um, these auxiliary losses, and then we don't do it in the right way, right? We can actually introduce bias to the training process, and this could cause us to penalize like long tail uh, behaviors that we actually want to simulate, but we might lose as a result of doing this. Okay, so another approach is maybe we can use data augmentation instead to robustify our uh, policy in other distribution states, right? Um, so for example, a clever way is maybe you can take a real world scenario, right? Real world training data, perturb the initial state of the actors slightly, and then ask it to learn to recover from that of distribution state. Another approach is maybe you can just trial a bunch of simple random perturbations, like random translations or random rotations of the input states, and use that as data augmentation to train a more robust policy. Again, this Approach is super simple, very easy to implement, and minimally changes uh, behavior cloning. Um, but just as in uh, using auxiliary losses, it can be sort of challenging to come up with good data augmentation strategies that actually exposes the policy 
um, to those of distribution states that it would encounter uh, during closed loop simulation. So maybe a more natural approach is, okay, what if we just expose those policies directly to those uh, same out of distribution states it would encounter during closed loop simula simulation, but during training instead. So to do this, recent work sort of proposed to unroll the policy uh, in closed loop differentiable simulation. And then um, at each time step, sort of feeding back the actions that um, was induced by its, or the states that was induced by its actions back as the input into the policy and enrolling that over time, right? And then after you do this, you can actually just apply uh, simple behavior cloning in order to minimize the difference between the trajectory that your policy took and then the ground truth trajectory that a human took in the real world. So this approach allows us to train the policy directly to recover from its own mistakes, right? Um, that is from the other distribution states that um, it would encounter during closed loop simulation. Um, but then oftentimes we don't actually know what a human would actually do in these other distribution states. So a simple proxy that a lot of these recent works do is they simply just um, ask the algorithm to, or they simply just uh, ask the model to uh, match what the human driver did um, originally. Um, Okay. So uh, I think a more principled approach to this um, task is uh, we should be able to actually query or ask a human expert, what would you actually do in these other distribution scenarios, right? And use those expert labels instead to um, train your policy. So this is the classic algorithm of uh, Dagger, uh, where we sort of iterate between training a policy using behavior cloning and then collecting a new data set, right? Um, by unrolling your policy and then querying an expert for its um, expert actions. So this approach allows us to directly supervise a policy with expert actions, uh, even in these out of distribution states uh, induced by its own mistakes, right? Um, but uh, interactive experts are often not available in practice, right? Or even if they are like, it's kind of, it can be prohibitively, prohibitively expensive to incorporate them into the training loop for learning these actor simulation models. So instead of um, querying an interactive expert, um, maybe we can encode our prior knowledge about what constitutes realistic um, driving behavior into reward functions. And then we can sort of augment behavior cloning with reinforcement learning. Um, so we can use reinforcement learning to supervise the policy in these out of distribution states, right? So now the behavior cloning component um, as before, acts to increase realism and gives us a very like strong supervision signal as to how to imitate how human drivers behave in the real world. But now we have this additional re reinforcement learning component that allows us to robustify our policy in other distribution states. And this is particularly important um, in rare or other distribution scenarios that are that we would want to simulate. So um, the downside of this approach, however, is we still need to manually design a reward function for this purpose. And in addition, we still need to manually uh, trade off between the behavior uh, cloning objective, which is our realism objective, and then our RL objective, which sort of acts to robustify our policy. Okay. And then if we take this idea one step further, instead of manually designing a reward function for this purpose, maybe we can just learn the reward function directly from data, right? And one particularly popular instantiation of this idea in uh, traffic simulation is the idea of generative adversarial imitation learning, also known as Gale. Um, so here the idea is we're going to learn a discriminator to distinguish between an expert's um, trajectory versus the learner policy's trajectory. And then we can use this discriminator as a sort of realism reward function in order to train the learner through closed loop simulation. So conceptually, this idea is really nice. Um, it allows us to learn realistic driving behaviors uh, directly through closed loop simulation. Um, however, uh, in practice, training such a model is notoriously difficult because of this like uh, minimax training objective. Um, so if any of you have trained again before, this is like sort of the same idea. It's going to be very challenging to sort of just get this uh, tuned and trained correctly and stably. Okay, so the techniques we've seen so far 
sort of focus their attention on how to simulate realistic and robust uh, driving policies. All right. And another critically important aspect of actor simulation is how do we capture the full distribution of human driving behaviors out there? Um, and we'll, let's take a look at some basic approaches uh, for doing this next. So one way is to learn a hierarchical policy uh, to simulate actor behaviors. And this, uh, this approach builds on the intuition that human driving is typically quite intentional or goal-directed. So if we can explicitly disentangle um, these high-level goals from the low-level controls, like our steering and acceleration, um, then perhaps we can learn policies that better cover uh, the sources of multimodality in human driving behaviors, right? So for example, we can learn a policy um, that models a latent variable um, that might capture things like goals or styles or intentions. Or alternatively, we can learn more explicit hierarchies um, using waypoint goals or route goals to model the most salient sources of um, diversity in human driving. This approach allows us to generate um, sort of diverse multimodal simulations of how a scenario might evolve over time. Um, but trying to learn this hierarchy in a supervised manner often leads you to learn latent spaces that are um, entangled and uninterpretable. And if you were to try to handcraft um, an explicit hierarchy, well, that can be quite challenging as well. In order, if you were to, yeah, that can be quite challenging to do right as well. Another popular approach within the community is to try and train like an, a zoo of RL agents through self-play, right? So the, here the idea is we're going to iteratively, um, let me see if I can play this as well. Maybe not, okay. Yeah, so here the idea is we're gonna try to iteratively introduce actors into a, an environment with sort of different incentives and different um, capabilities. And then we're going to train them together against each other in the same environment. So over time, what we'll expect to emerge from this process is sort of a zoo of diverse policies that we can sort of compose together at, um, at the end to create increasingly diverse and complex scenarios. So this is another great way to learn um, diverse policies uh, in closed loop. Um, but again, you, it's really difficult to in, uh, encode human-like driving into a single reward function. So what ends up happening is you can learn these uh, very diverse policies using this method, but perhaps it'll be more challenging to learn um, human-like driving as well. Okay, and then last but not least, let's take a look at some ways we can learn controllable actor behaviors. As this, as we discussed earlier, part of the um, part of what we do when we specify a scenario is we want to specify sort of the test intentions and how like different actors would um, we expect different actors to behave in that scenario, right? Um, so for example, we might be interested in having an actor cut in front of the self-driving car, or we might want to simulate a traffic jam scenario where everyone is driving very cautiously. Um, and to do all of this, we actually need actor behaviors that are controllable. So let's talk about ways to do this next. So one approach is to sort of design behavior policies that perform particular maneuvers. And this is actually a very common way to create scripted um, actor behaviors. For example, by designing actor behaviors that only perform a cut-in or only aggressively breaks, right? Um, and if you were to take this one step further, you can actually um, learn behavior-specific policies using techniques like reinforcement learning. And actually, this has been particularly uh, popular um, for learning sort of adversarial policies that uh, learn, yeah, learning adversarial policies that, for example, try to collide with the self-driving car and stress test the self-driving car. But the same idea can apply to learning other um, behaviors as well, like merging on an on-ramp. So this approach is simple and allows us to create very, um, it allows us to create like reliable targeted behaviors that we can compose together in order to create um, the scenarios that we care about. However, it requires that we design or learn a new policy for each kind of behavior that we care about. And as you might imagine, that could be quite um, unscalable to do in practice. Um, another way to do, uh, learn conditional or controllable behaviors is to learn conditional policies, right? Where we can simply control the policy at test time by changing what conditions we feed into that policy. So um, these conditions can be things like driver commands, like turn left, turn right, right? 
It can be a level of courteousness that you want the actor to follow. Um, it can be a waypoint goal for the actor, or it can also be sort of what do I want this actor to take? Now, this is a very simple and interpretable approach um, to the problem. And it allows us to sort of modify the behaviors of the actors at test time simply by changing the conditions that we feed to the model. Um, but one downside of this approach is that oftentimes um, it might exhibit generalization errors if we give it other distribution conditions or conditions it hasn't seen before um, during the training process. And in, in addition, the conditions that we want to control over, we actually need to know about those uh, during training time. And we actually have to have had those labeled so that we can actually train these conditional policies. So recent work have tried to enable inference time controllability over sort of arbitrary conditions. Um, and the high level idea here is now we can train a single unconditional policy, right? And then modify its behaviors um, at inference time only sim um, in order to uh, simulate arbitrary behaviors. So for example, on I guess your left here is a work called CTG. And CTG tries to learn a diffusion-based policy um, on which we can sort of impose arbitrary constraints by guidance functions, right? And then on the, I guess, right here is a work called Strive. And here is, is it's sort of a similar idea. We're going to, um, we have a latent variable model um, representing our policy here, and we can actually optimize the latent variable um, that's given to this decoder um, to achieve uh, a certain constraint that we might want. So for example, in Strive, what they want to do is uh, create safety critical scenarios. So they'll optimize to find a latent variable that decodes into a safety critical behavior, right? So the strength of this approach is in its flexibility. We can sort of uh, enable arbitrary uh, controllability over arbitrary conditions at test time. But then um, so far, at least, all the approaches we've seen are um, typically require quite um, some time during inference, right? And this makes practical usage of these methods uh, unscalable so far. Okay, so that sort of concludes our tour of um, actor simulation. Um, so just in summary, we've gone over a couple methods or uh, recent works um, and focused in particular on how those um, works uh, allow us to achieve realism, diversity, and controllability in our actor simulation, right? And hopefully this session has been sort of helpful in providing you an overview of the problem and sort of what open questions still remain. Um, I think next, what we want to do is shift gears a little bit and talk about um, how do we simulate realistic SDB dynamics? So um, before we get started, first of all, why do we even want to do this, right? Well, typically the way an autonomy truck interfaces with the real world is by issuing control commands, things like um, the steering angle you want, um, how much pressure you want to um, put on the brake pedal or the throttle, right? And these control commands are what actually um, tell the self-driving vehicle uh, how it should move in the real world. So in order to test this autonomy stack in an end-to-end -end fashion, we need to be able to model um, how the self-driving vehicle translates these control commands into how um, it would actually move in simulation. And this is the role of the vehicle model, right? It takes the same control commands as a self-driving vehicle in its input, and then it's going to predict how the self-driving vehicle is going to behave in response to those commands, right? So where will it go next, right? What is its, how does its internal dynamic state change? Um, so our goal here is then to design a vehicle model that allows us to both faithfully uh, predict how the self-driving vehicle would behave in the real world, but in simulation, and to do so efficiently. Um, now, one side note is that, of course, we can use the same vehicle model as well to improve the fidelity of our actor simulations for other actor, uh, other cars in the scene as well. And this creates a trade-off, right? How much fidelity, um, kinematic fidelity do you need uh, for your for the other actors in the scene versus how much complexity you want to introduce to uh, simulating those actors. All right, so perhaps one of the simplest and maybe most well-known approaches to vehicle modeling is the kinematic bicycle model. So this is a very simple um, model of vehicle dynamics that uses the laws of motion to predict how the vehicle would move over time given acceleration and steering. And to do this, this model makes a couple of assumptions. 
uh, first of all, it assumes that sort of the rear two wheels and the front two wheels can be sort of modeled as um, a single front wheel and a single rear wheel. And this gives it its name of bicycle model, right? The second assumption it makes is that the vehicle motion occurs only on the 2D plane. And then the third assumption it makes is that there's no longitudinal or lateral tire slip, right? So this gives us a very simple model of vehicle dynamics. Um, that's often very, very easy to implement. And another advantage of this approach is that there's few, very few parameters we need to estimate in order to um, get reasonable results of it. However, uh, some of the assumptions like no tire slip um, can actually lead to unrealistic dynamics, especially if you're in you're simulating high speed scenarios or you're pushing the limits of um, your vehicle, right? And furthermore, um, you would think that things like the weight of the vehicle would actually matter to how you would simulate the dynamics of the vehicle, um, but this is not accounted for in the kinematic bicycle model. Okay, yeah. So a higher fidelity vehicle model is a dynamic bicycle model. So in contrast to the kinematic bicycle model, now we can take into account vehicle parameters like vehicle mass, uh, the moment of inertia, tire stiffness, et cetera. Right? And as you can imagine, this approach allows us to simulate the uh, SDV's dynamics with much greater fidelity. The downside now is that we have many more parameters that we need to estimate. And if we don't do that well, um, we can the our simulations could actually diverge and become unrealistic, right? And moreover, even with all of these improvements, um, this model still makes a lot of assumptions about, um, yeah, this model also still makes a lot of assumptions that might not hold in the real world, um, especially at the limits of driving. Okay, so one final note um, I wanna make is, well, so far we've only seen models of like single body actors or like single body vehicles, right? But what about multi-body uh, vehicles like the tractor trailer setup of our self-driving trucks? Um, it turns out it's actually relatively simple to extend these uh, kinematic or dy dynamic bicycle models to incorporate a trailer as well. Uh, and this gives us uh, models like the kinematic tractor trailer model or the dynamic tractor trailer model. Um, and I think that's it. So today we, only just touch on like the bare surface of um, vehicle modeling, um, but hopefully this provides you a flavor of like, what is a vehicle model? Why do we need and care about it in simulation? And sort of what are the basic uh, techniques that we can use in order to simulate um, the vehicle dynamics? Next, I'm gonna pass it back to Siva and he's gonna tell you about the final piece of the puzzle, which is how do we model the vehicle platform? All right, yeah. thanks. Cool. Uh, thanks everyone for still attending. I know it's like past 5 p.m. So I'll try to give a quick overview of um, kind of the high level bird's eye view of sensor simulation and hardware in the loop simulation, but I might go uh, a bit faster over some slides that cover specific methods. But yeah, so Kelvin mentioned before that we talked about virtual creation and dynamics. Now we want to actually put the time system in the loop in the simulation. And we want to simulate the sensor to the self driving vehicle, such as LIDAR, camera, radar, et cetera. And we also want to model the autonomous system executing in real time, how it actually respond to this scenario over the course of many time steps. So I'll go over brief, both of these sections briefly. So first we'll talk about sensor simulation. Uh, we'll primarily be talking about LIDAR, camera, and radar. These are the main sensors that are being used for the self-driving vehicle for perception. And as we mentioned before in the previous talk, uh, uh, the previous section of simulation, the same desirables apply. Realism, controllability, diversity, and speed. So these are the three sensors we'll be talking about. There's also, of course, as Andre mentioned, the hardware section, many other sensors that are on the self-driving vehicle, such as GPS and IMU. But these are the primary ones that are used for autonomy for perceiving the scene and making plans. And you'll notice for all three of these sensors, LIDAR, radar, and camera, they're all sensors that measure the interaction of the light at different wavelengths. Uh, interacting with different surfaces of objects in the world. And then for LiDAR and radar, these are active sensors. So they're emitting light at a particular wavelength and seeing the response at a receiver. And for cameras, this is a passive one where it just receives uh, uh, photons from the visible wavelength spectrum to create the images. So I'll first primarily talk about LiDAR. Uh, already mentioned by Andre in the hardware section, LiDAR will send emit, emit like a pulse 
at a particular time. And we'll focus on time of flight lighter. So the most primary common sensors for the self-driving vehicles that are used in industry today. Um, you'll send a particular pulse of light and you'll measure the response and measure how long it will take to get back to the receiver. And that will result in a detection based on the time it took to respond. You can generate a point cloud based on the distances of uh, the different objects in the scene. And yeah, I'll skip the video for that. Okay. So uh, I will kind of give a quick overview of sensor simulation. This applies for both LiDAR, camera, and radar simulation. My kind of overall thought about sensor sim is that there are three main tools you can leverage in sensor simulation to generate realistic sensor data. There's physics, there's data, and there's neural networks and machine learning. And the three of these together, there are many different approaches that use a subset or all of these approaches together. We have a list of them here that have been covered in the past few years, and I'll quickly go over some of them in the next few slides. But to elaborate, like, what do I mean by physics, data, and machine learning? Um, physics is kind of building analytical models of the world. You make some approximations of how the real light interacts with the scene. And you try to create a computational model of it in your simulation to generate the sensor data. And there's been a lot of work in the computer graphics industry for developing analytical models of how light interacts with object surfaces. So a couple here that you, I mentioned are ray tracing, rasterization. You basically assume that light, which is a kind of a wave length, you can assume it, like a wave, you just assume instead it's a array with a particular origin and direction that you can cast into the scene. And you compute, for example, for ray casting, triangle ray intersections to generate your point cloud. There's also volume rendering, which we'll talk about for some neural rendering approaches. And there's also in the rendering equation, like material properties, such as BRDFs that you can use to model, uh, at least for images that is relevant. And then for LIDAR, there's uh, BRDFs at a particular wavelength for the infrared spectrum. There's, of course, also data, which you can use to either leverage to learn parameters for your analytical model, or you can use data for machine learning, where you can kind of train on this real world data of LIDAR or camera and then generate simulated versions of it. So those are the kind of three main tools. Um, one example of like a physics only based type of approach is in the current like kind of car like game engine, you'll generate a set of rays that match the sensor configuration of your LiDAR sensor, number of beams, azimuth resolution, uh, the min range and max range of that sensor that maybe the sensor will see up to 200 meters away. And then you can generate an initial point cloud based on the meshes of the world. So this is an example here of ray casting based LiDAR simulation. And there's of course also some more higher fidelity physics models available uh, outside of kind of like the computer vision industry, but more on like the radiometry, uh, geographic survey uh, work. There's some uh, methods that do much higher fidelity LiDAR simulation, but you have to specify much more detailed geometry and material uh, of the asset representation you have. And you have to do much more complex simulation. Uh, in this case, like this is a program called DIRSIG. It will actually do like the signal processing of measuring how many photons are coming into your receiver over time and get like a time response curve of the pulse and then apply signal processing to determine the actual time of the peak to generate the final lighter point cloud. So you have much more control of the scene, the sensor and accurate modeling, but the downside is you have to have full knowledge of every single parameter in your scene representation and your sensor model for rendering. And it's quite manual to build this type of representation. And it's unclear if you can kind of use this for real world, large scale, complex, like urban scenes and self-driving. And uh, of course, as I mentioned, you have physics and you also have data. So there's some recent work on doing differential rendering with LiDAR simulation to kind of estimate the parameters of your sensor model or for the geometry and materials of the scene. Based on real world data, you can put optimize to match the physical models of your sensors. Then in addition to physics and data, we have data with neural networks. There's been a lot of work in the computer vision community on generative modeling for point clouds. So you can use either a VAE or GAN, VQVAE and implicit GAN, diffusion model, et cetera. You basically sample from a lane distribution. You have a general model that outputs the final point cloud. Um, it's simple and fast, but you don't have as much controllability of the scene as you might want. And additionally, there's been works that try to combine all three of these tools together, data, physics, and machine learning. So 
Uh, you can see here some examples where some people use game engines to create an initial version of your point cloud. And then they try to make the real simulated point cloud better match the real world data through some type of adversarial training or style transfer to kind of match the point clouds. And one particular noise that people model in particular is this notion of ray drop. So being able to model that certain points or pulses that you send into the world in, in the real world don't ever come back to your receiver or are not strong enough to be responded as a point as a point in the letter detector. So there's been several works on a uh, game engine base. There's also what uh, lighter sim, which is does tries to build real world uh, asset representations in your virtual world uh, to get kind of more complex, diverse scenes. And there's some works that improve ray casting and ray drop to be a bit more uh, physics inspired. You can see an example here between physics only based simulation and using machine learning kind of to improve the realism to better match the real world point cloud. And once again, to kind of like bring it back to like what our overall goal is for a closed simulation system, we kind of want to show that you can create safety critical scenarios and have the time system run on the sensor data to generate kind of a system evaluation performance of how the SDB this response. And recently, at least also like this, this year's conference, the CVPR, there are several works on doing neural rendering for LiDAR. Um, so similar to camera, you can send rays into the uh, neural network representation and perform volume rendering. And there are several works that try to generate point clouds using this representation rather than just RGB. And you can also simulate intensity. There's some works that also do kind of like a dual return and beam divergence associated with some of the sensor phenomenon you might see in a LiDAR sensor. And now I'll talk briefly about radar simulation. So radar, as Andre covers, like uh, the typical radars that you might see on a self-driving vehicle are FMCW radars. You'll send uh, waves and then measure the Doppler effect and response over time. And similarly, there are same three tools you can use to do radar simulation, physics, data, and machine learning. Uh, in the physics-based approach, very similar uh, approach to like ray casting, or there's this method called shooting and bouncing rays, where you can kind of model the wave as a set of rays, and then the receiver as a sphere, and you can kind of measure the incoming response to see what the overall range Doppler image looks like for the radar sensor. And uh, additionally, for radar simulation, you can do data-driven simulation. Uh, typically, radar will be much coarser because the wave length is much larger compared to the other sensors we talked about, like LiDAR and camera. So you'll only get like coarse detections on these things called scattering centers for different actors of interest like vehicles. So some data-driven simulation approaches to simulate the scattering center locations of certain actors and just get the sparse detections with Doppler information available to them. And then that's provided to the autonomous system as input for evaluation. And then there's some approaches that leverage a combination of uh, data and game engines to kind of do style transfer, uh, like, like this approach here where they do rendering in Carla, and then they apply some type of style transfer approach to be able to make the radar data more realistic to what you observe in the real world. All right. And then lastly, we'll briefly cover camera simulation approaches. Uh, and yeah, I think the most of the people here are already familiar with how cameras operate and the type of data you can observe with it. So once again, here's a list of approaches that have been kind of categorized into data, physics, and machine learning. Um, and we'll kind of break them down a bit further next. So once again, for camera-based simulation and rendering, you have ray tracing and rasterization as very common approaches in game engines. Uh, also, there's data-only based type of camera simulation approaches where you just apply view warping on the image. Given some estimation of the depth, you can kind of warp it to new views to allow for the SDV to deviate from the original trajectory that you collected in. And then we also have neural rendering representations that you can use to kind of create new scenarios that you can then render with and generate realistic data. And of course, there's like three types of uh, machine learning approaches I kind of outlined here. There's generative models where you kind of sample new sensor data, uh, style transfer where you kind of maybe have an initialization from physics of the initial scene you want to reconstruct or render. And then you have a network kind of in paint the regions to see what it looks like. And then finally, there's the neural rendering approach where you kind of reconstruct based on the sensor observations you observe in the real world. And camera simulation in the computer vision community has sometimes been divided into subtasks 
such as novel use synthesis, being able to generate new views from what you were originally collected in, as well as actor insertion. So being able to insert moving actors into a particular scene. And then there's, of course, the full version of camera sim where you can modify where the actors are in the scene, remove actors, add actors, as well as simulate from new viewpoints. So here's some examples of novel view synthesis, such as view warping. I'll, I think I already kind of covered this briefly, so I'll move a bit faster for these approaches. There's the neural rendering representation, similar to what we saw for asset library reconstruction, where you can create geometry and appearance uh, based on neural rendering. You can also use the neural rendering approach directly for sensor simulation. And here's an approach uh, for block nerf to render large urban driving scenes uh, at scale in San Francisco. Uh, there are some works that combine neural rendering with physics engines. So some works will try to build asset representations of the geometry and maybe some appearance, and then use that to then apply physics simulations such as weather and uh, lighting changes, and then composite that with your original real data to generate scene variations. And then, as I mentioned, there are some subtasks for camera stims such as actor insertion. So here's an example where environment maps are collected from real world data, CAD models are inserted into the scene and you get realistic actor insertions. And then there's also learning based insertions um, where you can just kind of take image segments of existing asterisks in the scene and then kind of composite them into the real world, uh, real images, and then apply some type of depth and occlusion reasoning to get realistic new scenarios. And yep, this is another kind of data warping approach for camera simulation, but for the full system with actors and background. And there's also standard graphics approaches, similar limitations to before. You can uh, have very high control of the scene, but the realism and uh, performance is not as quite as good as using real world data. It can have a domain gap typically with the time system performance. There's some work on generative modeling here. So you can see uh, this is the drive can approach where you can kind of unroll a lane code over time and generate the sensor data to be a bit more uh, temporally consistent, but you can still see that there's some artifacts. And for sensor simulation for a time system for self-driving testing, you typically want the sensor data to be extremely stable over time so that you can ensure that you get the same scene evolution that you would might see in the real world. And you also want to be multi-sensor consistent across views. So the car that you see in camera one might be the same exact car you see in camera two, and also matches in appearance with the lighter on the vehicle as well. And that's something that kind of neural rendering generative models still struggle with at the moment. And some works will apply game engine based approaches to create, say, a semantic annotation of the scene. And there's lots of image translation methods out there like pix to pix and uh, maybe like also the enhancing photorealism enhancement, where you'll take the semantic buffers or G buffers of the scene and apply some network processing to make it better match the real world data, either in an unsupervised fashion or in a kind of supervised fashion if you have paired data available. And lastly, there's also this like work on generative modeling. I'm sure maybe some people have seen at this workshop or at not this workshop, but at CVPR this year, uh, kind of like world models, large language models or diffusion models that are able to generate very realistic content. Um, it seems like a really promising direction. You can get really good high fidelity simulation results, but there's still a lot of work I think left in that area to make it fully controllable, to truly measure the system performance on these simulations in closed loop. So definitely some ongoing work to be done, but very promising, interesting results. And then, of course, there's also the neural field representation, similar to LiDAR. There's several works on neural simulation for cameras. Uh, so you can typically decompose a scene into static background and actors, and then you'll apply neural rendering for the scene to generate different types of images. Uh, so there's still a lot of work to be done on getting the artifacts to be reduced and to improve the speed of the rendering performance for these type of neural rendering methods. And here's one of the works that we presented this year at CVPR, and we'll show at the poster session as well, which is Unisim, where we kind of uh, enhance existing novel view synthesis methods to better handle extrapolation. So we try to improve the realism of the camera simulation when you have closed-loop simulation in particular in mind where the SCB trajectory deviates from the original to be extrapolation rather than interpolation, and also where we want to be able to complete the assets a bit better 
than just from the views that they were observed in. So uh, in summary for sensor simulation, we kind of talked about the three main tools one can use to do rendering for real data for the autonomy system. And there's all this combination that's still being done in progress, I think, to find the best balance between how you leverage physics rendering, how you leverage data, and how you leverage machine learning to get the best of all three to get the performance you need for low domain gap, but high performance of your system. And this kind of kind of summarizes all the advantages and disadvantages, but I'll just kind of move forward for this. Okay, so next thing we'll talk about is hardware in the loop simulation. So all our previous sections have talked about autonomy systems as a software system that you run in closed loop uh, and you can kind of evaluate its performance. But we didn't really talk about how the autonomy system is not just software, it's also hardware. It's actually on a vehicle platform like a truck or a car as being driven with a particular compute system that actually sends actuations to the vehicle that needs to respond over time. So in the software and loop, we kind of assume an ideal case where we can just get all our sensor data simulated, we run the autonomy system, and then we see its performance. But in hardware in the loop, we can actually measure um, in real time with a particular test bench truck compute, how the system responds to actuations and electrical signals of the actual vehicle that you're running on. So that kind of summarizes the differences between software in the loop and hardware in the loop in this slide. So in software in the loop, you can typically use whatever compute is available to kind of build your simulation and autonomy system and run and evaluate performance. It's typically much faster to iterate with uh, because you can run it on the cloud at scale. And the disadvantage is that you can't really test the full autonomy system running on the vehicle as if it, as if it were on the real vehicle. And that's one of the benefits with hardware in the loop. You get a more complete testing of the system. Um, you can simulate real-time performance, including the latencies, because uh, typically a real-world system, the sensor data will come in at different times, and you need to respond uh, within, like, say, a certain time frame, under milliseconds or less. And being able to see how the sensor data comes in asynchronously and you respond to it accordingly is an important component in hardware in the loop simulation. But the downside is that you require the exact compute and soft, like a uh, hardware that you actually run on the truck or a car uh, exactly in your simulation to ensure the same performance behavior. So typically people will do software in the loop simulation to do a lot more development and prototyping. And then later on, they'll move to hardware in the loop to kind of verify performance before they drive it in the real world. Cool. So I think we summarized uh, sensor simulation and hardware in the loop simulation. Here's like overall picture showing all the components to connect together. You can build the scenario. You have a world state. You have the time system in the loop interacting over time. And as we talked about before, we have these desirable properties of realism, controllability, diversity, and speed. And that kind of summarizes simulation. Sorry for going a bit fast, but I hope it covers the main concepts. Uh, happy to answer any questions we have for any of the sections. Yeah, thanks. I think there's a question. Please go ahead. Oh. Yeah, question. Um, thanks for a very um, thought-provoking discussion about simulation. I had a question about your discussion about actors, and I'm wondering. I, I thought about three kinds of actors, and I don't know whether they count as long tail, short tail, or whatever. But one is the classic um, kid runs out into the street, you know, to catch a ball or something. Is that? An, an example of something you would simulate or something that clients ask you to simulate? Yeah, for sure, definitely. I think uh, that, that's a, those are examples of actors and scenarios you would want to simulate in your closed-up simulation system. Okay. And then, so the second example is um, based on a personal example, driving down the freeway, somebody in one of the lanes, I think they fell asleep and then they went off the side of the road went into the gravel and then they woke up and then they turned the steel wheel and drove across all the lanes of traffic. Is that kind of an event that gets simulated and if so how? Yeah, that's a good question. So I think um those types of scenarios that are long tail, it's nice to be able to potentially collect them in the real world to re-simulate, but also you can want to design the simulation to uh, either through the generative methods or manually. And uh it involves all the components we kind of talked about. You want to be able to create a particular behavior of an actor 
one thing Calvin talked about was like courtesy, but in this case, you want to measure like distraction and how that kind of condition on distraction, how you might have more careless driving per se. And then you need to also model the vehicle dynamics of that actor, potentially kind of skidding along this road surface. And then you want to simulate all of that with the proper sensor data accordingly, which means building the right assets. And then and I guess I would add that the other thing that made this kind of tricky is the reaction of other drivers to that crazy car. Right. And everybody else has to respond to all everybody's reaction to that car. That's like a uh, multi multi phase mm -hmm. simulation. Yep. So, and, so, uh, so then the third example is the, the usual drunk driving case where somebody looks like they're driving funny, so you kind of stay away. How does how does that fold into your simulation and policy planning? What? Think this one? Oh, sure. I'll briefly summarize and Kelvin can elaborate. I think um, handling those type of behaviors is very challenging. Uh, I, I think you have to learn from data, but also maybe have controllability to like say, like, how do you create uncertainty in the actor's behavior such that it makes it hard for the time system to respond? And we kind of touched on it for some of the sections that there's like this notion of adversarial attacks. If you can create adversarial scenarios that kind of make it much more challenging to a time system to predict what's going to happen, you then want to still be able to maneuver safely. And I think, yeah, all three scenarios you talk about, while definitely challenging to simulate, are all scenarios we do want to simulate in, say, Wobby World or any simulation system that you want to use for autonomy development. Does that answer your question or I'm not sure if it yeah. did? Oh, thanks. You're welcome.